I am Annabelle Gaberti. You may know me as the founding and managing partner of London and Paris law firm Crefervy. Crefervy is the best law firm to support the creative industries navigating complex business issues wherever they are in the world. In this new iteration of Crefervy, which is 10 years old this year, we have launched annual and monthly subscription plans that allow you to stay up to date with relevant legal updates and news, focusing on the creative industries. Via our weekly newsletter, our weekly thought leadership articles and our lawfully creative podcasts, you are empowered to lay out your strategy for your creative project, which is compliant with latest legal and business updates. Subscribe today on crefovy.com slash store for the English version or crefovy.fr slash magasin for the French version. This is Annabelle Gaberti and you're listening to Lawfully Creative from Crefovy. It is not easy to reinvent oneself, once a lawyer in Canada, as a Europe-based digital agent and rights expert in all things relating to streaming. Yet, my guest today, Wendy Bernfeld, managed to do just that, and is the managing director of Amsterdam-based consultancy firm Rights Stuff. Often cited in the trades, such as Screen Daily, Wendy is the go-to person when contracts and business affairs updates relating to the streaming industry are needed. Let's hear it from her about the highs and lows of the streaming industry in these times of economic turmoil and cost-of-life crisis. I wanted to know how she got her start in becoming an expert in the streaming sector. Yes, I was born in Montreal and uh, initial university there, but then uh, switched to uh, Toronto and Kingston. So I began in Montreal, then Toronto. I trained as a lawyer. Uh, you, did you did you speak French in your family? Or, I mean, Quebecois, or did you speak? No, English? we were first language English, but okay. at the time when I was younger, I was almost bilingual in French, and that was because before, of the school. Yeah, because of school and work yeah. and jobs, and okay. then then when I moved overseas, which I'll tell you about later, to Amsterdam, yeah. learning Dutch pushed all the French out. <laughs> so my, really? my yeah my I, apparently when you learn it much later in life then it sort of conflicts with other life. Oh, it pushed the French out. I get it. It didn't <laughs> remind you of French. It just, no. you had to some, free some space. Yeah. It's right very now. funny when I would be in Cannes, for example, in a taxi, I would break into a, a French, but then a couple of Dutch words would come out and the guy, okay. would be quoi? you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so I began, I began in... Uh, I don't think the French understand the Dutch w- words because... No, no definitely. Like Italian, no, don't don't even understand Quebecois. Yeah. That's another thing, so... <laughs> But I did, I mean, I was, say, working knowledge of French, and uh, I began in in law uh, and then uh, practiced in Toronto for... So, yeah, you were, so, so indeed, so, so you trained as a lawyer, and, and, and then you actually did more than just training as a lawyer, you actually worked, if I remember well, was that in-house or in private practice or both? Yeah, so first, first I was uh, one of the Supreme Court law clerks, and then uh, practiced... Uh, in-house with a large firm, Blake Castles, in sort of like the Suits uh, TV series, you know, with the shoulder pads. And I I did litigation. uh, I was in the 80s, surely. Yeah, exactly, 80s. uh, Was that in Toronto then? By that time, I was in Toronto. Okay. And uh, after that, uh, I went, I had made a decision in my mind to switch to the entertainment side. Okay. But in those days, I'm showing my age, uh, we didn't have, you know, entertainment law or, you know, business school entertainment. So I traded off with a, a local entertainment firm and I said, I'll do your legal and you teach me the business, you know, film and TV and this Wonderful. sort of thing. So I, that's how I kind of got. So you in. switched to private, to in-house. Um, so I was uh, first in a large legal. firm, then a small firm, still a, a law firm, yeah. boutique. Then from there, got a job in-house as yeah. a counsel in what was Premier Schwa First Choice, the movie network, which is kind of like your Sky or uh, Canal Plus. Mm-hmm. And I was first an in-house lawyer and then um, morphed into be the commercial side uh, as, an, as a buyer of movies. 
and also co-production. Is he that first choice, premier choix? Uh, yeah. In pay TV, it it's really important, as it is now in the internet, as we'll discuss, the rights and the legal is actually quite an important underpinning for sure. the technology crossovers to content. So having that legal background was very helpful. Um, but I, I did make the switch to be an actual a buyer and biz dev person. Okay. And then I got hired uh, to leave uh, for Europe, what I thought would be a two-year job, um, to move to Amsterdam of all places. So that was from Toronto to Amsterdam. And that was with whom, sorry? The 91 to 93, I went uh, the other side of the ocean and the other side of the table to be managing director of Alliance Atlantis, which was a distributor. In Lord. Amsterdam. Distributor and production company out of Canada. Okay. But their head office was Canada, and I became the distribution and co-production international office based in Amsterdam. So it's Canadian company, but right. um, European subsidiary. Okay. And that was how I came supposedly for two years on the sales and co-production side. Okay. And then uh, I, I, it was supposed to be a short job and I never left Amsterdam. After that, I went back to the you, buying side. You, of you, you met your husband there uh, uh, as well, did you not? Only at first I had uh, taken a job on the other side of the table, still okay. work with yeah. um, what would you would know a pay TV company that was Filmnet, Nethold and Canal Plus over eight or nine years. And in the middle of that period, after switching back to be a buyer in house there in Europe, then I met my husband who is Dutch. Okay. And uh, yeah, eventually we married, had children, etc. Did yeah. you keep your surname, Bernfield, or is that yes? Yeah. I later became Canal Plus International, and I ended up the CEO there before forming my own business in 99 right but we did, were... did you actually sorry did you actually set up uh, right stuff your business in 99 yes wow so between uh, so 91 to 93 was alliance atlantis managing director 93 to 99 was filmnet nethold and canal plus they were all the same conglomerate of 30 company countries uh -huh. of a television and pay-per-view the precursors to VOD, but right. different countries around the world, we would joint buy and do deals, you know, from studios to indies, European, international. But it really was the precursor to the internet and VOD. Uh, so both. That's true. I think the internet more sort of came out around 2000 and you set up your own business in 99 already. So when you set up Right Stuff, was that already with a view of providing services to these um, alternative distribution channels to uh, yeah. to co content or audiovisual content, so to speak? I mean, what was the business plan back then? Because 99 is a long time ago. Yes, yes it yes, is. It is. Years ago. Again, showing my age. In 99, the... Your experience. You're showing your experience and <laughs> wiseness. And my idiocy. No, the... Uh, well, perhaps in my naivete, I thought that by setting up my own business, mm. a small boutique, it would be less crazy hours. But in reality... <laughs> it's worse. It you have way more in your own business. Yeah, I mean, no matter what I did, whether I was in-house as a CEO or a junior or a lawyer, no matter what I did, I've always had these, you know, 60 plus hour weeks. And then as soon as I went into my own business, the only thing that changed is that you had more flex. You didn't have to show up literally between. Yeah, that's right. Spots. You can choose your hours, but then, which would must have been good for you because you had uh, several kids. But, uh, yeah, but I mean, was, I mean, having your own business, you know, is. Yeah, uh, it was a lot. And it, Travel time job. <laughs> but what I really liked, I mean, more seriously to answer your question, what I uh, uh, gave up uh, and didn't miss was the politics. Yeah, you sure. copy on an email, 20 people. That's so true. Yeah. Because when you work as an in-house, in an in-house capacity, I'm talking here in my experience as an in-house lawyer, you've got two kinds of clients. You've got the external clients. Uh, that you have to serve, but you also have your own in in internal client who is your boss or your, you know, yeah. N2, as we say in French, like, you know, just a direct supervisor. 
And it's so much pressure and also such a waste of everybody's time. <laughs> to have there's a lot of time, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, whereas when you're a consultant, it's, it's less secure. You don't know where your next job comes, but mm -hmm. people hire you for precisely what you know what to do, how to do it. There's no time for politics or exactly. posturing. And often they welcome, uh, most of the time, they welcome really independent, hard advice. So... I continued to work with Canal Plus as a as a consultant, which was like a core client. Oh, okay, so so just if you just sorry, so when you set up Right Stuff in 1999, 1999, was it as a law firm or was it? Oh, a, no. Okay, it, right. But I had what already. Was, what, I had what already, was what was it? What how did you uh, brand and how yeah. do you still brand this this business of Right so, Stuff? So Right Stuff is. 70% of the time we are working for platforms, VOD, okay. before they launch. That means content curation, which I did from the buying days when I was in-house, but also the acquisition negotiations. Then you'd get into the contracting and rights deals. Mm -hmm. um, so 70% of the time, often invisible, working for platforms before they would launch in SVOD and later ADVOD. So you would support them in negotiating the rights? Well, I, uh, I think it goes further. I would often be hired to find the content, uh, match When, it, the when you say content creation, would you actually uh, do this creative job of finding the content? No, that, I mean, you have to understand. Amazing. That. It's like the whole supply chain, really. Yeah. When I started, remember that I'd worked 15 years as a buyer. So I had not like my first time, you know, I've been to markets uh, five times a year, I, all over the yeah. world, all the different content. So cool. So, but what they wanted was shortcuts. Like if you're trying to get children's content from, you know, Greece or something, it was right. handy to, to know where to go and what to do. Okay. But, uh, so you one, had a network. There was a network, but one part of the job that that was the smaller part more joy and paid less. And then the hard part of the job, bigger, was the actual hardcore negotiations for rights, uh, deals, uh, deal memos. And if they didn't have lawyers, we would do the legal, but of licensing. It's a subset of legal. It's not all legal. It's just licensing. And if they did have lawyers, we worked wearing a business hat with the lawyers to pass on what things are standard in the industry in VOD, what works, what mm. doesn't work. Kind so of coaching the lawyers and, and the client. Well, and and uh, a bit, you know, in, in on the business side, because sometimes, uh, well, VOD work, moved quickly. The internet moved quickly. So you yeah. couldn't spend six months negotiating. You, you had to really move fast to launch oh. service. The other 30% of the time, I would be on the side of the producer or the rights holder or like a sales agent who was already dealing with so hang on and before we move to the other side sorry so um how are you billing it and so do you still do this by the way is that that's my core for 20 years okay, yeah okay because you I still do even today yeah all right, right okay because you were saying we were doing it as if you yeah. were talking about the past so i was wondering yeah. whether the job function had evolved but yeah to, to it's, identical. It still, it's identical it's identical you're still doing uh, it the 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 function of helping a platform before it launches, then it, I'm out of a job, then they move to a new region or a new genre or a new and then you come back. Yeah. And then they may ask me to come back. So yeah, yeah. You know, as a random example, if you think of Netflix uh, eight years ago, you yeah. couldn't as a producer give away for free a documentary. And now documentaries are a big part of Netflix, you know, so the genres change, but also the business models change if they add TVOD or ADVOD or do different things. You, 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 so, so TVOD, what's that? Do you just want to know? Transactional VOD. Transactional VOD, okay. And then the, my core was more the SVOD, subscription VOD, like a right. Netflix or movie.com or Sky or Orange. Yeah, it's just and definitely. then ADVOD would be what you think of like uh, YouTube, but now all okay. the ad-supported and fast. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so how would you pay yourself, so to speak? Would you have, a, 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 as a consultant, would you say I'm bill per hour, like a, a lawyer who is doing litigation or, or arbitration? Or would you say this is the package? 
uh, for the curation job, it's going to be, uh, you know, this, this um, pot yeah. of money for the um, negotiating the, the rights. It's going to be this packet, this, this yeah. uh, packet. Uh, it, it's very client specific, what their project is and what they're doing and how much time it takes. But usually for the, the clients on my website that were one to three years long part time, we had a highly discounted monthly retainer based on X days per week mm. uh, or per month rather. But other times people would just want to hire me for a target list or for coverage at a market and then it would be at uh, day rates. Um, I never did. For that sort of strategic work, I didn't do hourly rates because okay. in one hour, I might have a week's worth of contacts for them that someone else would spend a week trying to gather. So yeah. what we would just work out what was needed uh, uh, and figure out a price based uh, a little more per day if it was only a brain pick for a day or two. But if I was on an ongoing operational basis a few days a week for a year or six months, then it it was almost the same as hiring me in the house as a part-time employee. Right. Like a much discounted, but then yeah. they don't have to worry, oh, sit in on this call or come to this market because they're not paying the high consulting tariff yeah. when you're on an annual or semi-annual basis. And and in a way, what was what is wonderful is that they're getting the lawyer as well as the business person with you. Yeah. There and and I think the 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 lawyer part, I, I would market myself as the uh, as the pragmatic approach, mm -hmm. meaning you could take a 40 page agreement, but try to have a two page deal memo, but the deal memo had to have in it more than just price and title. It had to build in a lot of the hidden business points that are often buried in legal legalese mm. and carry them up to the front, but in a short sentence way so that in a few pages, the deal that could later be a 50 page long form is already negotiated before it goes to their in-house or out. As, as a term sheet. Again. Yeah. So it went, when this term sheet, sometimes they would be done by sellers or buyers leaving out a lot of stuff that cost money mm -hmm. <laughs> and other time and it wasn't the fault of the lawyer who would get it later to fix because those points had already been negotiated and not addressed so part of wearing the lawyer hat for me was to be invisible but bringing bringing up to the front yeah. harder discussions that then made doing a long form fast you know of course so, yeah. yeah, that's that's a very good approach. Yeah, in a way, you were saving a lot of time and money to your clients. Saving a lot of money, yeah. And so, in, in today, do you still um, brand yourself as a lawyer as well as a business person? Do you do you have a license uh, with the yeah. cat bar and uh, and Instagram yeah. or? I have, I'm still annually. I'm still a member of the a bar in. Canada, uh, the law, uh, plus uh, in the UK, I'm on the role oh. of solicitors. Okay, but I don't, uh, I don't. When I'm uh, working with clients, yeah, I describe what I'm doing as well. It's an entertainment industry term, business affairs, who are often lawyers uh, before, yeah. and then they go to business affairs, like in the studios. Okay. And so, yes, I could do legal, but because I don't. Uh, like what we would do is we would partner with where needed with an outside law firm yeah. for specific matters that were really legal or unique to the jurisdiction, transfer of control, assignment, um, you know, uh, music rights, uh, things that were very important. I didn't, what I would do is take 80% or 90% of the deal do it and then the last parts still should go through a lawyer either in house or outside so yes I was a lawyer but I didn't market that as my core I'd say 20 percent of my job is around legal and licensing deals okay production etc but uh 70 or 80 percent is on the business side but right. they really overlap uh I did I do market it as a uh, on the platform side, more as a biz dev uh, yeah. 
and buyer. Consultant. And on the sales side or distribution, I would yeah. be uh, helping people reach platforms so, that are beyond the big five. Okay, yes. So, so just just to finish on this point, just to describe your your function, um, the, the the trades newspaper screen um, d describes you as a um, digital agent slash rights expert. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So you, yes, you you wanted to talk about the. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that description because the the rights expert means that I would uh, understand and help with all the rights, including contracts and long forms. Mm -hmm. But the agent role is because I wasn't myself a sales agent or distributor. Yeah taking the IP, mm -hmm. I would just be their agent um, and paid fees, and they would sign the deals in their own name. Mm -hmm. So the deals signed, I guess like a law firm, are done between your client and the person they're doing the deal with, yeah. but I would, you know, broker Initiate and... Initiate everything. Yeah, and, and go through and to the... the documentation. Yes. Yeah. So you wanted to talk about indeed about the the, the buy side, uh, what you do for. Oh yeah. So on the other side of the table, which yeah. is only about a third of the time, mm -hmm. uh, because I was a buyer for platforms, I would become familiar with platforms even before they launched or moved to new regions, which is kind of handy when you are a producer or a seller. Yeah. And if the producer or seller is only dealing with traditional uh, buyers yeah. or dealing with, say- What do you mean by traditional buyers? Like, uh, like TV channels or- Yeah, or all rights yeah. buyers. Mm -hmm. All rights buyers, like sales agents do deals with okay. an all rights buyer. Okay. And what would be missing in a way is if a Netflix or Amazon didn't take your movie, then a lot of people were stuck in the middle because mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know who else to go to. Yeah. And still today, it's unclear for a lot of traditional uh, sales agents. Others are more aggressive and active and digital mm -hmm. and producers as well. So what I mean by that is there's 3,000 VODs in Europe alone, but we don't focus on that. We focus on maybe the 50 or 80 that actually pay a flat license fee or that have been around for a long time, like not just on a revenue share. So it's kind of, in a way, curating the platforms to help match make who could be a buyer and in what model, TVOD, SVOD, AdVOD. So hang on, let me just, uh, in plain English, you're saying that you, you, so here you would be representing these platforms and you you would be are you saying you would be finding the content for them or is it just if, you mean when I'm on the platform side like, a, like a I don't deal. know why are you, are you talking you say this is thirty percent of your time or are you actually talking about when you represent the producers who are stuck in the middle because they didn't get the content bought by the likes of Netflix so uh -huh. yeah so let's talk about the producer or the sales agent mm -hmm. if they don't get the deal they had hoped from a Netflix or Amazon yeah. Who else do they go to with their indie film? So well, other platforms. Um, so there is have to go to all the markets, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, because most of the VOD platforms, the SVOD ones, are not at markets or festivals. Those are traditional. Oh. So they're not going okay. and spending at the Carlton Hotel and on the Croisette in Cannes. I mean, the big they're never going to be. No, the big players are there, but the for budget, a lot of the mid-sized platforms, telecom, cable operators, uh, SVODs, they are actively buying long before COVID, uh, mm -hmm. like me for a decade, online and virtual. So by email, by phone calls, et cetera, exchanging information. Right. And uh, so, for example, for years, I worked with an Australian VOD platform that I'd never met in person. We've done everything on uh, Skypes and yeah. later Zooms. Mm -hmm. um, but they were heavy buyers in, in SVOD. But to travel to France or whatever was, was disproportionate. They would allocate their budget to content okay. instead of to travel. I see this is strategy. Yeah, but what I would say is um I so, would so how do these guys how do these guys find content? They reach out to people like yourself or 
Are there some pl some online platforms that one can go to, the likes of Sinando that you have when you get registered to CAN, the CAN yeah. market or? or yeah, that doesn't, I mean, you can always do that, but you'll go through 4,000 companies worth of available films. That That's, anyone can do that and spend a, a year <laughs> trying to figure out what to buy and who from <laughs> and for what region. But I think what the platform would do is they would want shortcuts. Like if they're trying to program a horror channel, which ones are available in the region from which buyers in which window, what would work for their market, mm -hmm. you know, so that's the, the sort of the matchmaking part. But so how do they go about it, especially if they don't go to the, uh, the markets to see the new stuff? Well, you can see everything online. You, you, you get stuff with email, you get sent a private screener, but it's usually through trusted people, either through sellers that they're working with, sales agents, okay. distributors, okay, okay, okay. or they're dealing with digital or consulting like me, uh -huh. uh, or they're going direct when they're occasionally at a festival or market. Like I'm not saying no one ever goes, yeah. but what I was trying to explain is if we ignore the big five, hmm. And you ignore thousands of really small startup platforms and you look at the tier, what I call tier two, it would be a telecom or cable operator like Orange, yeah, yeah. Um, a Sky, um, uh, Virgin, uh, you know, those types in the UK or in France, Salto, you know, it's the mid tier where there are television networks with an SVOD or RTL with an SVOD. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Channel 9 in Australia has an SVOD stan. Uh, those types uh, would be the, the mid-tier that would buy programming, but they can't buy it global. They would only buy for their platform's reach. Okay. So in, in some cases, like Viaplay, it's 10 countries. In Orange, it's eight countries. You know, whatever the number of countries is, they're still credibly buying, but it's not a global deal. And then you go around. And the beauty is in SVOD. Uh, so this is one type of your clientele. Yeah, that well, on both sides of the table, they're either the platform or it's a seller wanting to know who can I sell my film to? Mm -hmm. Okay, Netflix didn't buy it. Gee, I never approached Orange. I never approached uh, Canal Plus. I never yep. approached Salto. I never approached RTL. And then you have to individually go to those larger. Do, do they ask you for to introduce them to, do they ask you to introduce them to these uh, platforms? So we yeah, uh, well, they, they, I, it, it's Sellers. so it, it very much depends. Um, it's very tailored, very bespoke per client. Some of some of the clients know of the platform, but they don't know how to reach them because that particular buyer hasn't published his email. Then I would have to do an introduction. Mm -hmm. Other times they have published their email, they're in contact, but they would hire me, for example, in a what I'd call a back channel way, which is... What do you mean by publish the email? You mean sent the email to... Well, uh, if you go to a website, uh, pick pick a platform that you want to reach a buyer at. Let's say it's Sky, because yeah. you're living in the UK. Yeah. And you, as a human, find the buyer's name. Okay. And if did they publish their email on LinkedIn? Did they publish their email in... Oh, a the email address, you mean? Email address, yeah, right, right. contact. And yeah. some some of them do and some don't. Where they don't, because they don't want to be inundated with thousands of emails, mm -hmm. then I could do an introduction okay. to the person. Or where they are already in contact and dealing, they may not have a benchmark mm -hmm. for the deal offer that is coming. Yeah. If you get an offer from Stan in Australia and you've reached them, how do you value that? Is 5,000, is 3,000, mm. 50,000? So often the consulting is to help with uh, giving- uh, They don't know what is market, is, is sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, market standards, so to speak. Yeah, and it, it all has to do with the type of film, the genre. If it's three to eight years old, it might be in the subscription VOD window still. Mm -hmm. But if it's older than that, it could be in the ad supported window, like classics. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe they have an offer from an advod now, but their film's only two years old. And if they put it 
on free on YouTube now, it's going to be very hard to sell it sure. to somebody else after. So that's sort of um, advice on Windows markets, platforms. Also, I think the, uh, the other thing that's useful is some of the producers, you think of the big uh, the f big f uh, 10 and the competitors to them, the telecom and cable. But then there's the genre specific platforms like um, Out TV for GLBTQ or, you know, Shudder for horror mm -hmm. or Hopster mm -hmm. for kids. And yeah. they're niches, but they're niches 100% in the genre that the producer wants to sell. Right. So that's where you don't want big availability lists going in a MailChimp <laughs> to uh, yeah, yeah. a platform, but you want tailored, curated emails. Sure. Yeah. If you like this episode of Lovely Creative with Wendy Bernfeld, why not listen to episode one of the show with British music supervisor and scene placement broker Richard Kirstein. Lawfully Creative is brought to you by Crefovi. Yeah. Kind of, you know what I could say, Annabelle, it's like online dating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you want to match make uh, what we usually suggest is that the producer or the seller look at the platform's homepage and see the programming. And if their documentary is about Me Too, do they see other Me Too documentaries on that platform? Mm. If so, you could say it in your cover email. If not, you could say, well, you don't have any in this genre. Maybe we can offer you something in that genre, you know, but it should be really personalized, like online yeah. dating, instead yeah. of a mass mail. It takes a lot of time. Of course, it's, it's the, the added value of the uh, digital agent slash rights specialist, for sure. I, um, I, so I heard about you, Wendy, when um, um, you actually presented, you were part of a panel for the Screen Daily Talks, uh, presented yeah. with Wendy... The other Wendy. The Wendy Mitchell. <laughs> yes, Wendy Mitchell, who is yes, a presenter at various yeah. um, um, festivals such as EFM in Berlin and also Cannes. Um, and uh, um, so the, the topic of this, um, of this um, uh, Screen Daily talk, which took place, I think, in July 2021, was how deals, contracts and business affairs are changing in 2021. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was in partnership with uh, We Are UK Films, so mm -hmm. sort of trade body which is uh, representing UK uh, film players at um, EFM, Cannes, etc., all the big uh, festivals. So my uh, understanding of the takeaway of this uh, of this talk last year was that basically the uh, um, there's an acceleration of uh, distribution of content for streamers because COVID <laughs> and so um, uh, nobody goes to the theatre anymore and to cinemas anymore so um, yeah. I mean maybe I'm, 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 um, I'm being a bit too uh, um, you know um, manichaean like black and white in my approach but uh, I think that was one of the key points really that uh, there was an acceleration of the use of uh, of platforms to be able to uh, uh, to push the, the, the content out to the public um, would you agree or for you was there another interpretation of the main key points um, discussed during this this panel last year yeah I think in that panel last year, uh, we tabled four big changes that happened with COVID, mm -hmm. and they still occurred, um, except that now there's a, a huge pendulum swing of COVID. I was about to say, I was like, so do you think we're coming back to it? Yeah. We no, no, there's a huge, I mean, to me, to me and everyone, there's no substitute for the big screen. I think everyone understands that even in the digital sector. I think the only thing that's different, and I'll go back to your question, the only thing that's different is that now there's more an ability and awareness of hybrid approaches, yeah. where some things are for cinema and theatrical, and also there are companion pieces online. Where they are they release? Is that what you mean? De de depending on the window, it's just the awareness and ability to have fest. So, for example, the, let me let me break it down. The four things were festivals moving online. That yes. was step one. Yeah. Then there was virtual cinema, which was during COVID with cinemas closed. People like Modern Film in the UK would partner with art house cinemas, okay. share the receipts, and sell the film online, but mm -hmm. give the receipts portion to the cinema that was closed. That's 
you know, step two. That was pretty unique to COVID. I'm not yeah, sure okay, that's, just, on, that's yeah. not like an ongoing model. The third one, however, premium VOD is mm -hmm. still here to stay, such as when a studio releases a film, skipping all the prior windows and goes straight to its own um, SBA right. first, like Coda from Apple or um, Wonder Woman. Won the prize, actually, and the, and the award at um, the Academy Award. I yeah, think. won the Oscar. Yeah. So I think, uh, but what, what's interesting is that premium VOD model does exist indeed. And the fourth thing that happened that's lesser known is more in our area that we're talking about today with you is a huge uptake in buying of library. Because... Okay. Before COVID, um, there was a lot of focus, of course, on new. And then when production stalled uh, and also people were stuck at home uh, in captive audience mode, mm -hmm. they had more time on their hands to watch not only a Netflix or Amazon, but also a trial subscription from Mubi or Shudder or whatever their passion was, they had more time. And it meant that the consumer wanted more, but also the platforms needed to fill inventory. So for the first time, they went deeper back into libraries. I mean, even a big platform like Netflix uh, bought uh, the, the uh, Truffaut collection, which wouldn't have been... A what? Truffaut, François Truffaut. 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 Just as an example, they, it wouldn't normally have been something you'd have imagined Netflix mm. buying wow. until that moment. And similarly, other platforms went back to library. But from the, and that's very healthy for the industry that stuff isn't sitting on a shelf and yeah. it created a new window. And the library is often non-exclusive and you can sell it to five other platforms. Yeah same time so it just created more um buying and selling of stuff that already existed yeah. not just new so we these were the four takeaways and thanks so much for describing them in a, in yeah. a synthetic manner from this uh, from this um, screen daily talk last year we are now one year on uh, post pandemic, I mean, st still in a in a in a in a shit of a recession and, <laughs> and a terrible economic uh, outlook. Yes, but at least we can go out. <laughs> and even yeah. if we want, we don't have to wear masks. How nice! Yeah, exactly. That very kind of a of a rulers of this world to let us know, uh, let us uh, go out without masks. So yes, so so one year one year on. Do you think that those four trends are still um, current or, 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 or would you say yeah. that perhaps just the premium VOD is still, you know, very strong? But uh... Uh, well, I think festivals online are forever changed. I mean, um, Do you think? yeah, well, many festivals now have added a hybrid element. It's true. Yeah. And so even though they are in person, you can also attend hybrid in, in many cases, which was Things never... you keep on going like this. Yeah, it's already happening now. For example, uh, you can buy an online pass to the festival or you can go in person. I know, but I mean, I think always, I mean, uh, Cannes, for example, uh, uh, or, or even Berlin, I think they were doing it because there was always yeah. you know, this concern by the people from Asia, for example, they would not be yeah. coming to Cannes because COVID is still there or if they're in China, they're stuck in China because of COVID. But I, it's interesting to hear that you think it's here to stay, that even after I do. COVID, if the, yeah. the, the hybrid no, it, model will keep on going. Yeah, and to be honest, I'm delighted to hear this. I yeah, think, no, 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 it has to. Also, the industry yeah. needed that change. Let's yeah, be it's honest. so expensive to you, to, you know. I mean, it's great to go in person. I must admit, I love doing it, going to Berlin every February. You, still go awesome. in person. you can still go in person, but you can oh. go for a shorter time and pick yeah. up the rest online, for example. Right. I was not in Banff, but I attended online, or I was part... You were part where? Of, I'm in Cannes, Banff. And part of the time I was in Cannes, but then the rest of the time I was online. But I think it's practical from a business-to-business -business and the business to consumer point of view. Okay. Toronto Festival at the moment is phrased as only in person. That's September. Um, but which, Venice, has, which one? Venice has Toronto. Toronto is, is just September. in person. But Venice is both. Well, Venice is not a market, so. Well, it is now. Yeah, they have uh, they have uh, yeah. um, they have a gap funding market I've been attending for years. Ooh, and that's for gap financing. Um, but I know what you mean. It's not like a hardcore first run mark. Yes. But 
I think if we're talking from a consumer point of view, those trends of having some element of online will continue. Virtual cinema, I think less so. Premium, yeah, I don't see yes, it. But library buying is huge. It's yeah. huge not only for the SVODs, but now for the newer trend, because you asked about one year later. Yeah. Focus on AdVOD and fast channels. Wow. And uh, fast is free ad supported uh, streaming, but it's basically like free TV linear. Do you have some um, example of fast AdVOD? Yeah. So there's, there's, I guess, the the traditional ad vod, if you call it traditional, and YouTube, and YouTube, where you, the consumer, pays nothing. Yeah. But you can go in and out on demand anytime. And from a business to business point of view, the producer or seller gets a rev share, right? Now, you know, what? Revenue share. Right. As the fee. They're not getting a, a price, they're getting a share like 50 50 or whatever of the revenues from advertising. Yeah, yes. that's the ad bond. But fast channels, F A S T, uh, what they are is like if you have a Samsung or an LG TV at home, or you will have channels on the TV okay. and they are around themes. <laughs> so, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, Tribeca, Tribeca Festival yep. launched a fast channel in the UK. Okay. And the fast channel is older Tribeca films. Oh, wow. And the idea of fast is very distinct in it's not ad vod because if a it's scheduled like old fashioned TV. Mm -hmm. So if we place this movie, let's say Coda at nine o'clock and you Annabelle go in at 10 after nine, you can't rewind and start at the beginning. Oh, you can't rewind. It's just like real TV. You, okay. You're joining it midstream. Okay. And uh, so it's kind of like free TV, but using the internet. Mm -hmm. And the um, money is also a share of revenues. So it pays a lot less than free TV. Yeah. So there's some dilemma going on in the market between AdVod and Fast and the monetization. Mm -hmm. But there, it's, it's become an explosion this past year mm -hmm. because there are a lot of SVOD channels and now consumers want to get also always want to get stuff for free. So if you look at a good example for you is Curiosity Stream, which is the kind of Netflix of documentaries. It's in 200 countries. It's an SVOD only of docs. Okay. But they've also launched a fast channel, mm -hmm. meaning there's an element that's free ad supported, mm -hmm. different titles and things like that. So a lot of these platforms are starting to embrace multiple models. Gosh, I mean, I think that consumers just still have so, too much time on their hands. <laughs> I mean, you know, this 35 hours a week is not good because then people keep on, you know, going to all these places and get, and because it's free, then they're going to gorge themselves with, with content. My gosh, it's, it's a bit concerning. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, Perhaps it's good for the industry, but uh, okay. So you're saying that this is definitely a trend of fast VOD, which is going to grow according to you. And, and it, it, it basically leverages all these catalogs of- Well, regular SVOD and ad VOD leverage the catalog too. Yeah, It's okay. just a different way. And I do think there's too many and it's a hype. Oh yeah, I guess. You know, so I, you, you weren't asking me at that moment what my personal opinion was, but just mm -hmm. about the industry. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to me, AdVod and this idea of linear programming is not new. It's everything old is new again. <laughs> right. So, but what it is, the beauty of them. I mean, AdVod, you have to do with it because, yeah. because it, in any case, because of a piracy issue, mm -hmm. it will happen one way or the other. So it's best to actually go with the flow Yep. I mean, for all titles, obviously, you know, not for new titles. There I mean, is, I mean, there really are, awesome. but but there if you are, if you don't do it as 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 um as a writer, no, you're going to to get fucked. Excuse my French, because in any case, it will happen because of a piracy. The consumers are win. Are not. So it's mm -hmm. left to have the advert in place. Have offerings. Uh, have some offerings intelligently done. Indeed, indeed, where you get at least a share of the market. Revenue. Yeah, But I, I did want to say one, I think a very strong thing for fast channels or linear, again, maybe because of my age, the trouble with all the on-demand 
is that if you've ever tried to sit one night and figure out what you want to watch on Netflix, it's difficult. Even, you can take an enormous amount of time yeah, trying to figure tired. it out. It's just like oh, so much stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm using it as a as a cute example, but the 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 linear programming days allowed for intelligent programmers to create a schedule for you. Okay. That helped you discover titles you might not know the name of. In other words, on demand on YouTube. But I must know what you're looking for. This sleep right? level scheduling is actually tailored to yes. consumers. So yes. So what I'm trying to wow. say is in, in YouTube, you still have to know what you're looking for if you're looking yeah. for a title. Yeah. Whereas in, in traditional old-fashioned television, you could yeah, yeah. program Harry Potter at nine. Yeah. And at 11, say, if you liked Harry Potter, watch this sleeper film from Finland about a magician. <laughs> and the person who's coming off the one is already interested there. It's like they called them a sleeper. It helped consumers with discovery. Right. And that's something that some I of- I never use that. Because yeah. I usually know what I want. Wow. Some of the services are not focused on a discovery and others are and very sophisticated and very yeah, it's very smart guy. But I think the fast channels that are tailoring to a particular audience, a schedule, uh, are trying to look at programming the old fashioned way, you know, what's in the morning, what's after school, what's at night, you know, whereas on demand is any time of day. And there, there, uh, you know, many of these platforms are doing different models with the same titles. So they're going to capture cons consumers. Yeah. Or entry points are coming from different. I think countries. it's a generation thing, though, because I do think the young generations don't want to be told what to watch. I really do think that they're on an on-demand. Well, you uh, know, there's an interesting thing. I know that you're French. Were you aware that earlier this year, Netflix launched a linear channel in France called Direct? I didn't know that. So even though Netflix is SVOD, mm -hmm. it, as an experiment, launched only in France, old-fashioned linear Direct. in France, and it's called Direct. So maybe Is it working well? Uh, yeah, it's apparently done very well because they were focusing on... I'm not surprised. The French like to be told what to do. Well, I'm not sure that it's told what to do, but it's intelligent curation a bit, you know, for that market, instead of just everything from all over the world thrown at you, available in a menu. Mm. There's something that, they're, that they were doing that worked well. It may well roll out to other regions. I don't know because I don't live there, but I... The way... The way I become an educated um, consumer is that I listen to podcasts uh, uh, which tell me, which tell me, well, this title is great. This film you should go and see. This one is piece of shit. It's going to be a waste of your time. Um, so, for example, for Kermit and Mayo's uh, take, you know, on films, which, which we used to be a BBC program, and now they've launched uh, separately, independently. So I listen to that podcast every week. Um, and also when I'm going to watch a movie, I always check, you know, what does Rotten Tomatoes say about it? Because I don't have any time for bad content. So um, anyway, um, I, I, I am though under the impression that the young generations, they just don't want to open their laptop and say, okay, today I want to see this and bing. And they don't want to have any ads. You know, I just want to watch the content, close the laptop, move on. I mean, I, but Anyway, but my grandmother's generation, yes, of course, because they know nothing about, you know, they would like to have all this linear program they can rely on, which means they don't have to think. And then they can also discover some other content about Marilyn Monroe or the stars from the, you know, movie system. Yeah. Whom they read yeah, like. Young but, generation, what was interesting, I have millennial kids. Okay. I was under a mis misunderstanding that my son corrected me on. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I thought it might what be happened. Well, I thought it could be interesting anecdotally. Um, it's not that a 23 year old won't go to the movies for two and a half hours sitting in a row. I don't think I could do that anymore myself. My, my kids do it. Uh, but what's different is when they open, say, YouTube, they haven't in their mind made the decision, I'm going to sit for two and a half hours watching. So it's wow, flexible. Yeah. They start something and then two hours later, they're still in front of the computer. Wow. So they don't feel boxed in or scheduled. Mm -hmm. So the issue of linear scheduling doesn't suit, but it is. No, it's not relevant. 
Attention is, span, they can sit for hours. I mean, they watch, my kids watch long movies, but they, yeah. they don't, they don't try to work around an external schedule. So it's, it's, so I think generationally, there's a big attention span, but at their own time. Mm. And that's really, really uh, a change for me from what I thought. I thought it was only short form, you know, but no, they can. <laughs> okay. I see what you mean. Well, it depends. It depends how. Yeah, I, I, it depends how you are focused on the content. I it, think now for me to start, to be in a theater, I, like probably the sequel, the sequel of Avatar, which is coming at some point, that I will probably watch in a, in a theater. But otherwise, all the content I watch online. Oh no, I love the theater. Listen, I'm in digital for 25 years, and I still go to the movies any chance I can get. Yeah. And even if I've seen it online, I will still go to the cinema. But not all movies. Oh. Only the ones that need. I think it's fair to say the ones that need a big screen a lot of movies don't need a big screen right exactly but yeah for me seeing west side story uh, needed a big screen but you know some Spielberg version uh, any version any. Where, <laughs> whereas seeing an, an art house documentary on poland in the war i can do on a computer yeah. you know i don't have to go and that's the struggle I, li I like that i like the fact that now we it's much more flexible the how you approach viewing and and, and consuming content I, I really like this but this fast thing thank you that was that was really interesting i, I wasn't aware of this new um well, for that, if you uh, want, if you want to uh, sneak at a few more, Pluto launched in France. Pluto is owned by Paramount in disguise, but it is uh, ad bod and fast channels, mm -hmm. and its competitor in America is called Tubi, T U B I, mm -hmm. and it's owned by Fox, and it's only in America and. Uh, um, uh, Latin I mean, 20th Century Fox or the Fox yeah. News? Yeah. Okay. Fox Studios. Yeah. But the point is that sometimes the small names that sound like kindergarten names are actually very deep pocket media conglomerates behind them. Mm -hmm, sure, and sure. Pluto was so successful that in the Nordics, uh, one of the big SPOD channels there called Viaplay. Viaplay has just stopped its own free TV, which was called Via Free. And it's doing Pluto instead in the north. Mm. So that there, there's definitely big trends around Advod and Free that should be taken seriously. Yeah, uh, sure. They're different than the window I respect and in a way prefer the subscription VOD window before from for monetization in Europe. Mm. In America, Advod's doing very well, but in small European countries, the Advods are are not you know, huge checks <laughs> so, yet. Yeah. There's been in the last month or so since Netflix has released its um, its uh, uh, quarterly earnings, the realization that uh, due potentially to the, um, uh, the, 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 the decrease in um, disposable income from uh, most consumers, it's difficult for them to uh, have memberships um, with, um, Netflix and also Amazon and also Paramount and also Disney Plus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I think I, I, I heard that in the US the average is free subscription uh, per family, which sounds really crazy to me. Um, so now that these streamers are sort of landing, so to speak, post pandemic, and also people want to allocate time to some other stuff and just consuming content at home because they can go out. Um, do you do you think that there's um, there's going to be some sort of um, consolidation potentially coming out of uh, of this uh, of this uh, realization that perhaps there's not space for three hundred streamers? Um, or, or I remember there was a, a website you mentioned, yeah, yeah. well, which was an aggregator. Well, I mean, so first of all. The three platforms per household in America is still cheaper than what they were spending on cable uh, before the streamers. They would spend $100 a month, and now they're spending 30 or 40 So you have to compare relatively to what it was like in... I don't even have another TV set myself. I never had a TV yeah. set in my life, so I can't believe they were spending $100 on cable. Even here in Holland, if you have an annual, if you have a package, it's, you know, 50 or 100 a month for... A Ziggo or in Australia, it's 100. So I'm, I, you shouldn't compare apples and oranges. All I'm saying is a lot of people turn to streaming because it is, even with a few networks, still cheaper. That's the good side. The bad side is... No, but you, uh, thank you for mentioning this because I, I never... 
I never took into account the cable uh, fees. Because cable I and never... telecom carriage deals. People, a lot of people cut their cable and switch okay. to streaming OTT. So are you saying that actually lots of people now have just terminated their cable subscriptions? Yeah. Well, it's called, it's yeah, it's churn. Um, many have, others have both, as I do. <gasps> And others have... Uh, you have a time to consume everything? I mean, it's not about time. It's no more time or less time than five years ago or 10 years ago. It's just what you want to watch when you're ready to watch. Okay. What can you get? So, for example, um, what, what, what my point was, though, those three are the big ones. Let's say each family has, I'm guessing, oh, Netflix, the average stuff, yeah. at Disney, right? Let's just pretend in America. Netflix, they have Netflix, Amazon, Disney. Disney. Right, right, right. Okay. Oh. But what you're missing is the smaller, what, what you would call niche. Like if I'm a horror fan, yeah. I'll pay two or three dollars a month, a month to get a service dedicated. For example, Curiosity Stream, if it's three dollars a month and I can't get enough documentaries, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a subscription to, to Curiosity Stream or horror will be Shutter, or GLBTQ out TV will be a couple of dollars a month. So these things are called stackable, and they're the small thematic. It's and it's like if you have a newspaper, a general newspaper, and then you have a cooking magazine and a sailing magazine. The same phenomena happening in video. It's price. It has to be priced cheaply, and very niche or micro niche. Right. Uh, one of the most successful, ironically, SVOD platforms of all is uh, an anime one in the States. And another one is called True Royalty, which only shows programs about royalty. Documentary, fiction, <laughs> short film, web series. All the Brits must be on this. But there's like... You know, there's dedicated, passionate subscribers that can't get enough royalties, so they'll subscribe. Oh there's a flamenco God. channel. Anyway, ah. I guess I guess all I'm saying is, yeah. I would I would distinguish between mainstream and small. Yeah. But in answer to your correct point about there's still too many, no matter how you slice it. Mm. Uh, two trends happening very recently, less than six months ago. R1 is called, for example, Strum, S-T-R-U-U-M, and the other one is Bundling, and I'll explain them. In the Strum case, I don't know if your audiences have a monthly gym membership that allows them to go to many memberships. Here it's called Class Pass. Okay. And so for $50 a month, instead of one David Lloyd membership, I can go to 100 different gyms each time once or something, you know, you get like coupons. So you're paying 50 a month, the same price, but you are allowed to sample the gyms. That model's been brought into these SVODs with a company uh, run by ex-Disney executives called Strum, S-T-R-U-U-M. Mm -hmm. It's not in Europe yet, it's only in the States, but okay. they currently have 60, six zero, of those little SVODs, DocuBay and, you know, BBC Select and, you know, uh, Docu you know, all the different ones that are a few dollars a month. And you can subscribe as a consumer to that and sample. And then when you're in and out of different SVODs, you can decide, gee, I really love um, movie.com and I'm going to get my own full-time subscription to it mm -hmm. so that's one trend that's helping the other trend that's helping is the old-fashioned everything old is new again bundling you know having not each item at the same a la carte price but bundling three or four for the price of one I think know. Peacock is doing this with Sky oh, Peacock is bundling Hulu is bundled uh, a it's number of the right Plus is bundled. So they 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 charge, say, one price a la carte. Mm -hmm. And then if you buy three, it's cheaper, you know. Right. So packaging and bundling, which yeah. frankly is old fashioned also to the days of cable. In yeah, but I think it's a matter of expectation. I mean, I would never, I, I would never, you know, I think it would be a waste of my money to to to, to put some uh, some money into this sort of uh, you know, 50 euros, like just to, to have access to all these, because you see the problem is that then all these, um, all these um, uh, stakeholders in the film industry were like, oh yeah, piracy, 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 and the time for popcorn of this world, piracy is terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. But why not you have like in the music industry, 
one or two um, uh, platforms, aggregators um, in the music industry called Spotify and Deezer and uh, Tidal uh, or Amazon Music, on which you can find all the catalogs. All the catalogs are on, and, and so therefore you, 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 you uh, I mean, you've got millions of titles on the, on Spotify, which, and I don't mind, I'm actually happy to, I'm okay to pay um, 10 quid per month to be able to have access to all this wonderful, great, uh, fantastic musical uh, catalog, repertoire. Well, um, it's too complicated in the film industry. And for me, it's, they're just dinosaurs. They're just dinosaurs yeah. in the film industry. They just don't want to change. They don't want, they don't understand that they need to aggregate all the content. No, 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 I mean, yes, two or three like, platforms max. And yeah, then no. consumers will be happy to, I mean, it's easy because at first it's easy. You just pay 20 euros per month and, or whatever. And, and then you've got access to all these fantastic titles instead of going mm -hmm. to go to, on time of, for popcorn or, you know, I mean, even on the net, it's very easy. You put uh, the name of the title you want to see, the year it was released, then one, two, three movie, and you're going to see you to, to, to be able to watch your content. Yes, it will be filled of ads and most of the time porn ads, which is annoying because every five minutes it goes through. So it's a bit annoying, but you know, um, I mean, at the moment, I'm, uh, and it's, it, I find this painful because I'm, the, you know, I don't want to do piracy. I am, no, like in the music industry, I, I, I want to be able to go to Spotify, to the equivalent of Spotify, and then be able to see, um, you know, um, the Year of a Dragon, uh, mm -hmm. or because I've listened to that podcast about Mickey Rook and how he was a star in the 80s. And so this title was mentioned. So I want to rewatch the Year of a Dragon. Or, you know, mm -hmm. like, and so, so this is something that the film industry doesn't get. And, um, and I think it's such a shame that they are behind the music industry. It's only my personal opinion. I don't want to, you know, put, to push you into this, um, into this uh, debate, especially since your own clients are um, in this business. But for me, it is, it's a bit like the book publishing industry. Mm -hmm. The book publishers are doing everything they can so that ebooks mm -hmm. will not exist. And they still have all the, the you know, territorial rights, country by country, um, and the London Book Fair, which is, you know, has been going on for hundreds of years, and they do not want to change. And I'm, I'm fed up with the system. I don't buy books anymore, actually. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't have a space. I don't have a space to store I'm them. Sure we could have, I'm sure we could have a whole podcast on that topic alone, but we're out of time. But I think that... Right. They are there are big differences, I think, in even the really? word film. Well, yeah, because you're you're still talking major studios and mainstream, whereas I'm talking about like Polish art house and Italian and French. And you would not be able to aggregate the entire world of content in one platform. Why well, if they do it for the music industry, why can't they do it for well, films? I mean, I still can't get many things I want on Spotify or Deezer. So I end up down. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, let's save that for another podcast. But I think it, you, it's really actually I found everything every and okay. God knows that I've got eclectic okay. place in music, but that's interesting. Okay. Mm. But anyway, that I mean, that's a whole other topic, uh, which we should do. I'd be happy to talk another time. Uh -huh. but I'm a movie junkie, so I'm uh, I, I see whatever Me I too. can from everywhere. I love it. And in the cinemas as well. There's a, there's a wonderful podcast I've discovered recently, which is called um um oh gosh i've forgotten but it's fantastic i mean there are so many movies uh sorry podcasts at the moment about movies about hollywood which are amazing and um and i'm discovering all these titles that um you know that uh, i was a kid in the 80s so i couldn't watch yeah. them else because they were they were, they were not you know, uh, yeah, you must remember this, for example, amazing about the 20th century films, if you're a film buff. Yeah. It's fun. I, I, every weekend, because now I don't have a cleaner because, you know. The, is that the, the name of your, is that the name of the podcast? You must remember, you must remember this. When I'm doing that. my ironing, because I don't have a cleaner anymore. Or I'm, I'm, you know, it's, I love listening to this podcast. You must remember this. And, um, and it's a wonderful way to discover the, the catalogs, the, the fantastic things which have been created since, yeah. uh, since, since I'd say the, the twenties, the thirties, I'd say. And um, yeah, I'm a film buff. I mean, we used to go to the theater every Sunday with our parents. What was your impression of, you know, um, what you heard and the feeling of 
uh, of the industry when you were at Cannes and also at the Monaco streaming um, uh, streaming festival, where I understand you presented as a panelist. Did yes. you get a good feel that the industry is getting back into its, you know, in full throttle? Or yeah, I mean, I really it was so so wonderful to be back in person. It was wonderful to see people again, as you say, after two and a half years of lockdown, but also uh, a lot of people learned and adapted whether they wanted to or not. We all had to learn or adapt during COVID and change that alone is a good thing because nobody approaches things exactly the same way anymore. And to me, that's very refreshing because I was always in an industry where it had to be the way it's always been and what very male very male oriented <laughs> approach well, what's, to life what's good is that um people are now more open to different variations I and see. there's that a general feeling was a little better. Some are still sticking very firm, as you point yeah, out, yes. in old ways. But that's also very individual. But for me, it, it was it was uh, it was really lovely to be in person, and I do see a sense of optimism. Um, finally, you know, so that's yeah. great because we all. Yeah, I mean, creativity will definitely prevail. But it would be great if the masses could actually experience this creativity in a way which is um, which is which is easier and perhaps less less uh, you know more accessible, less expensive. Yeah, well, hence having things available online is, yes. is really a great leveler, um, indeed. So I, I I've always believed That's that it. worked since '99 in <laughs> in, in the change. And it, but it's taken really a long time for for people to actually accept it, and not as a poor cousin, but as a um, uh, in its own right as a medium, you know. <laughs>